Thank you, Patrick, and welcome, Robin, and uh, to everybody joining this event and our series of events this week. Um, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Robin Kelly for the first of three talks. Um, he tried to convince me to keep this short, and I promised I needed to um, share a little bit of love before we get started. So Dr. Kelly is Distinguished Professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in American History at UCLA. He is a leading historian of social movements from interracial radical organizing in the US South um, and to international anti-colonial struggles of black intellectuals and politics, of black expressive culture as both a fundamental part of understanding political possibility, as well as um, uh, fundamentally also creativity and the joys of daily life. He's also a beautiful dialectical thinker, noting his inheritance of Hegel to his mother and of Marx and Gramsci to his big sister. He's the author of eight books, co-editor of six, those numbers might be off. He's also currently working on three book manuscripts, one a biography of the journalist Grace Halsell, uh, a new general survey of African-American history with Dr. Tara Hunter, and Black Body Swinging, uh, which are uh, the subject of these talks. So we are very um, privileged to be hearing these. Robin is also a beloved public intellectual who can be found anywhere from interviews on NPR or PBS to podcasts like Millennials Killing Capitalism or the Ergo Abolition Series or webinars hosted by Haymarket and Scholars for Social Justice. You know, I'm being very gestural here. He's a contributing editor to Boston Review, one of the most exciting sources of political debate and cultural work that we have. In a widely read interview called Solidarity is Not a Market Exchange, which was published in Rethinking Marxism in 2019, Dr. Kelly talks about how his inquiries have been shaped by questions um, in the world at the moment. He also offers such reflections on everyday life experiences and political motivations um, at particular historical conjunctions in, in his essays, introductions to books and prefaces to reissues of books, which I read as um, generous, generously instructive for, for readers to understand how to work dialectically. His first book, Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communist During the Great Depression was published in 1990, the so-called end of the Cold War was reprinted on the 25th anniversary amidst Occupy movement and all the uprisings around the world. The book's up uptake by scholars and organizers across these political conjunctures speak to the ongoing going salience of how black radical working class organizers shaped political culture and forged an interracial working class movement in the midst of state terror, relevant to both um, the union drive at Amazon in Bessemer, uh, Alabama right now, and of course, to the growing movement for abolition of policing, imprisonment, and surveillance. In Dr. Kelly's subsequent works, we can think here of race rebels, culture politics and the black working class, Obama's dysfunctional, freedom dreams, and uh, Africa Speaks America Answers. Dr. Kelly picks up dialectical tools uh, shaped by and inherited by Hegel, Marx, Du Bois, CLR James, Cedric Robinson, Grace Lee Boggs to offer new categories for thinking the terrain of politics in the present. These tools en enable him to show the power of everyday acts of resistance, the persistence of cultural critiques of capitalism, racism, and state violence, and perhaps most importantly, the creative imagination sustaining a sense of possibility for something different and freer. So with that, um, I am honored and we are honored to welcome Dr. Robin Kelly. Thank you, Jenna. That was <clears throat> so generous. And, um, and definitely you, you come to my funeral to help you know, send me off because you have such, such sweet words. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me just jump right into this because Thomas, first of all, thank you to the Havens Rights Center, to Patrick Barrett, who always has to deal with my um, non-response to emails uh, for the better part of two years, which is about how long it took to organize uh, all this. In a special thanks uh, to Jenna Lloyd for lots of different reasons, both for all of her brilliant scholarship, which I continue to learn from and teach, and also for being such a great mentor to my niece, Kayla Caldwell, who's a, a PhD student there in geography. 
Um, and just before I forget, um, Tony Gilpin is speaking soon, and we've got to read her long, The Long Deep Grudge, which is a great, great book. Great book. Um, okay, I have a lot to cover today, but uh, before I, I do anything, I want to give a kind of brief overview of the book I'm trying to finish. I noticed one of the worst things about Zoom is that you see people entering the waiting from the waiting room, and I keep seeing names of people I know. Uh, so I'm totally terrified since some people I really haven't talked to about this book, um, not in any detail. So um, again, I need to stop looking at the Zoom thing. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about it briefly and then go into a very um, complicated story uh, about uh, Timothy Thomas. Um, think of this book, Black Body Suing an American Postmortem as an abolitionist history of black resistance to state violence and racial capitalism. In the context, of course, is for me it was last summer um, when 26 million people came out into the streets uh, in the middle of a pandemic to protest the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and countless others. And then the fascist insurrection uh, in DC on January 6th, that's kind of the framing of it. So to understand both of these insurrections and this ongoing struggle uh, for the country, I argue, you know, really requires a different kind of autopsy, an historical postmortem that lays bare the structural conditions responsible for premature death. So each chapter <coughs> opens with a, basically a death, um, except for one chapter, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a person whose death and life I reconstruct along with the life and death of their neighborhoods, of the city, of the police, um, of generations who came before them. And to truly understand the cause of death means going back um, decades, sometimes a century or more. Uh, and by the way, this book is not about lynching. Um, my editor was giving me a hard time and she might be right about the title. Um, I trace the deaths and lives of our most recent casualties to the, to the blood at the root, quote to quote um, Abel Mirapol's lyric from Strange Fruit, this, the racial terror at the base of our system of exploitation and wealth accumulation. So the blood at the root is of course racial capitalism. And so th this is sort of the core of the book. Um, the book is not about death though. It's about black life and the struggle to preserve it. It is a history of abolition and an abolitionist history. Uh, swinging therefore means fighting back. Um, so besides Timothy Thomas in the Cincinnati Rebellion, I have chapters on Rakia Boyd in Chicago, uh, Mike Brown in the history of St. Louis in North County, uh, Jonathan Sanders in Mississippi, who was killed by, uh, was choked to death in 2015 while driving a horse and buggy. And that story also aligns with the history of uh, the provisional government from Republican New Africa in the emergence of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I have a chapter on Deborah Danner uh, in New York City, which is really a kind of inquiry into the way the state responds to mental health crises. Uh, Breonna Taylor in Louisville, um, Dominique Fells and the long black feminist struggle against murder of black women that is trans, cis, gender, gender non-conforming, queer. Uh, and by the way, um, that's the topic of tomorrow's uh, talk. Uh, and then there's a chapter on someone who is still living, but the state is trying to kill every single day. And that is Mutulu Shakur, the political prisoner um, who was basically um, has been holding on. I'll take, say more about that. Uh, but someone whose story I think needs to be told. And that is the next to last chapter. Uh, and finally, the last, final chapter is, was, is written sort of in light of the overwhelming backlash and the resurgence of white supremacist violence. Um, and that chapter asked the question, where do we go from here, abolition or fascism? So what I'm presenting um, is really just a fraction of a chapter which deals a lot with the city's long history of racist violence, that is the city of Cincinnati, going back, in fact, the chapter goes back to the 19th century to Margaret Garner. Um, the history of police violence, the failure of reform after a litany of, of reports and findings and consent decrees 
uh, directed at the Cincinnati Police Department. Um, but with the time I have, I'm really gonna focus on the ways in which uh, Timothy Thomas's killing was partly the, the product of administrative violence and he was a casualty of colonial uh, war over land. Okay, so now can I, I need to change, change, I share my screen because you can't look at me while I talk. So um, I'm gonna show some slides. Um, do I have, um, oh, I can do that, great. Okay, let me just start here. Okay, so bear with me here. Okay. Around 2.15 a.m. on April 7, 2001, Cincinnati police officer Stephen Roach heard the dispatch. We have a suspect, male, black, about six foot, red bandana, last seen eastbound on East 13th. He has about 14 warrants on him. Less than five minutes later, as he drove along Republic Street, he spotted 19-year-old Timothy Thomas scaling a chain link fence. He pulled over ran down the alley after Thomas, gun drawn, finger on the trigger. When Thomas appeared in full view, Roach ordered him to quote, show me your hands. But before he could um, comply, shot him in the chest. Uh, as Thomas lay dying, officers on the scene handcuffed him, eventually turning his body over when paramedics, paramedics arrived, though not relieving him of the restraints. He was rushed to University Hospital and checked in around 2.30 a.m. By 302, Timothy Thomas was pronounced dead. There we go. Now, Thomas's short journey to Hamilton County Morgue began as a simple Friday night cigarette run. He was staying with his girlfriend, Monique Wilcox, at her mother's apartment in Over the Rhine, a neighborhood on the northern edge of downtown Cincinnati. <coughs> they had a three month old baby named Taiwan, but could not afford a place of their own. So that night, he walked along Vine Street past a bar called The Warehouse, where two off-duty cops were working security. One of them, David Damico, uh, recognized Thomas from earlier stops when his family lived in Evanston. And, and he actually knew Thomas, uh, had outstanding warrants for traffic tickets. Thomas also recognized Damico, uh, and so he took off running. Damico called for backup and then took off after Thomas. Thomas sprinted down Vine, turned on 12th, turned again on Jackson, looped back to 13th Street before ducking into an alley, jumping two chain link fences and meeting Roach's bullet. Roach initially claimed to have repeatedly told Thomas to show his hands. And when he didn't, he believed he might've had a gun in his waistband. Fearing for his wife, he claimed, for his life, he shot first. <clears throat> when a police cruiser, video cam pro uh, proved the entire encounter uh, took less than three seconds. And after conferring with uh, Fraternal Order Police Attorney Stephen Lazarus, um, Rose changed his story, telling investigators that when he saw Thomas, he was quote, spooked, which is an interesting choice of words, of course, and his gun just went off. Now Roach was eventually indicted for negligent homicide, but acquitted in a bench trial. By the time the verdict had been passed down, he had taken a job on a police force in the neighborhood municipality of Evandale. Now, <clears throat> the black community of Cincinnati didn't wait for an indictment. Thomas was the 15th um, black man killed by police since 1995, the fifth in eight months. <clears throat> Just three weeks before Thomas was killed, Cincinnati's Black United Front and the ACLU filed a class action lawsuit against the city and the CPD uh, for its persistent pattern of violence, harassment, and misconduct targeting Black people. On Monday, April 9th, um, mostly Black protesters crowded into the city council chambers. Among them uh, were Reverend Damon Lynch III, head of the Black United Front and past the New Prospect Missionary Baptist Church uh, in Over the Rhine and Kenneth Lawson, who's the lead attorney on the class action suit, and Angela Le uh, Leisure, who's pictured there. This is Thomas's mother. Accompanied by Thomas's 16-year-old brother, uh, Terry, she asked one of the councilmen at this meeting, this is my other son. I know he has a ticket. Is he going to die too? 
After three and a half hours of heated exchanges, but no answers, <coughs> a crowd of about a thousand people gathered in front of the police headquarters in District 1. In a small crowd, a uh, small group in the crowd decided to pull down the American flag and run it back up the flagpole upside down, which is a, a signal of distress caused by unmitigated just, injustice. Later that night, the protesters were met with tear gas and rubber bullets. Within 24 hours, the city erupted in full-blown rebellion. Uh, Mayor Charlie Lucan uh, declared a state of emergency and imposed an 8 p.m. curfew. Um, still, uh, some two or 3,000 people, mostly Black working class, uh, took to the streets, armed with rocks, bricks, Molotov cocktails, hand scrawled uh, placards that read, you know, if my son runs, will you kill him too? Stop killing us, no police, no, no peace and no police. Um, now the Cincinnati rebellion was the largest civil outbreak, um, a largest outbreak of civil unrest since Los Angeles in 1992, and this is 2001. Uh, and the world really did take notice uh, the um, then NACP director, uh, uh, Kwesi um, uh flew in to Cincinnati to help manage the situation. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, III spoke at Thomas's funeral on um, August 14th. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton showed up the next day, uh, appeals by black leaders locally and nationally for black Cincinnatians to remain calm and nonviolent. Uh, when the police continued to attack unarmed protesters, felt especially hollow. The celebrity leaders who flew in for a photo op with Angela Leisure did not fully understand the level of Black distress symbolized in the inverted American flag. <coughs> As one over the Rhine resident put it, um, the Black leadership and civil rights organizations are trying to quiet everything down, but it's not working. Many here don't have a job. Almost everyone has had some running with the law. After you get out of jail, it's impossible to get a good, good paying job. Then they turn it around and say, because you have a record, it's all your fault. There needs to be a change because if it doesn't change, things can get a lot scarier than what we saw this week. Now, <laughs> nearly everyone who spoke at Timothy Thomas's home going uh, emphasized the sheer injustice of it all. He didn't deserve to die. He was a good kid, son, father, who made bad choices, but was turning his life around. You know, the whole spiel. He was unarmed. Uh, he died over traffic tickets. And while, you know, this may, uh, might appear to be the case, Timothy Thomas, like all the characters in the book I'm writing, was already vulnerable to premature death. He was a marked man before he became a man criminalized by bureaucratic means, by a system designed to discipline and extract revenue from a subjugated population rendered surplus. Angela Leisure was only 14 uh, when she gave birth to Timothy Duane Thomas Jr. on July 25th, 1981. She grew up in Chicago, at one point living on the far south side of the city, a few blocks from Trumbull Park, the site of a terrible racial violence during the 1950s when black residents moved into what had been an all white public housing project. Timothy was born in Arkansas where um, Angela probably had extended family to help out but was back in Chicago and pregnant again three years later. By the time she had her third uh, child, a daughter named Tanjalisa, born in 1990, she was living in the Robert Taylor Homes which is a massive public housing project with a reputation for crime and violence. At the time, HUD planned uh, to replace the Taylor homes with mixed income, low rise housing. But before the Chicago Housing Authority began relocating tenants in 1997, um, uh, Angela Leisure decided to relocate on her own to Cincinnati. And she visited Cincinnati, in fact, and, and, and liked what she saw. And uh, she said later, I saw children playing outside unattended. There were no drive-by shootings, no filth, no gangs riding on the walls. Um, 
Now, of course, there was poverty, joblessness, and violence in Cincinnati. Cincinnati was home uh, to more Fortune 500 companies than any other city in the country at the time. And yet the year she arrived in 1997 um, and settled in the neighborhood of Evanston, over a quarter of the black population lived below the poverty line. Uh, the region had lost nearly two thirds of its manufacturing jobs since 1969 and the service sector jobs paid a lot less. Nevertheless, she managed to raise her children alone for almost three years before meeting and marrying Eric Leisure, a, a native Cincinnatian who lived in Gulf Manor. They were married just 10 months before Timothy was killed. Meanwhile, adjusting to life in Cincinnati proved difficult for Timothy although his experiences were hardly exceptional. Dyslexia disrupted his education, so he dropped out of school, completing his GED through the Nativity Learning Center in Prince Hill. And by the way, you can see a lot of similarities between Timothy Thomas's life uh, and Michael Brown's. Um, after his son, Taiwan, was born, he aspired to work in the field of electronics, but all he could find were odd jobs and temp work, mainly in construction, he built, um, I'm sorry, his, his biggest obstacle proved to be the Cincinnati Police Department. The cops had begun chasing Thomas long before that fateful uh, April night in 2001. Uh, he had only been there a few weeks before he was arrested for receiving stolen property. He was only 16. Another day, he and his cousin and a couple of friends were simply standing outside talking when cops just pulled up on him according to his mother, and quote, literally threw them on the ground, put the knee in the back, pulled their arms back, put cuffs on them and searched them, but no one was arrested. Now these kinds of um, stop and frisk operations, I meant to show that slide, uh, became routine. When he turned 18 and began driving, his encounters with police became uh, even more frequent and more troublesome. In February 2000, uh, Thomas was stopped and cited for driving without a license. Uh, the ticket carried a fine of $100, which he couldn't pay right away, so it turned into a warrant. He paid the fine, but then from March 17th to May 4th, he was cited and recited 19 times, 10 times for driving without a license, six times for driving without a seatbelt, once for driving a car with tinted windows, uh, another for driving a friend carrying an infant with no car seat. Only one of the citations, only one, uh, was for a moving violation, basically running a stop sign. <coughs> he received other citations over the course of the year, including one for playing his music too loud, uh, added, to the traffic tickets he received that year were two citations for obstruction of justice. And these were issued in absentia for running from officers who approached him. Of course, the amazing thing is that the officers knew who he was, uh, which is why they could give him a ticket in absentia, okay? As a black driver, he was subject to racial profiling. License and seatbelt violations alone a result from random stops. They don't result from observing bad driving or defective equipment. These stops function as a form of data gathering. Police log the names and plates of those who were stopped into computerized databases, which are commonly read as a list of potentially suspicious persons. So when Thomas decided to run from the cops those two times, once in July and once in August, they knew his name, but they hadn't realized that his family had moved to Gulf Manor. So therefore, you know, when they sent out citations to his address, they had no updated address. So he didn't really receive those citations. Um, <clears throat> nothing he did though, rose above the level of a misdemeanor, but the persistent ticketing, inability to pay, inability to elude the cops, turned him into a wanted man. Thomas knew that uh, and, and his three-year-old ordeal, three ordeal dealing with the police made him terribly afraid of cops. My son had a fear of police officers, Leisure told the writer for The New Yorker. Um, his thing, 
this is what she said. His thing was, mom, if they can do this to me in broad daylight with everybody watching, what would they do in the dark? And of course, Thomas knew the answer. So did his mother. So did the entire black community of Cincinnati. And the city had a very long history of, race, of racist police violence going back to the origins of the police in 1850. Uh, Cincinnati was one of, um, of over 100 cities that blew up, in fact, <coughs> during the summer of 1967, and again in 68 in the wake of Dr. King's assassination. The immediate spark uh, for the rebellion uh, was the arrest of a black man, uh, Peter Frakes, uh, who was peacefully protesting the wrongful conviction of his cousin for the murder of a white woman. He was jailed. Frakes was jailed for unlawful pedestrian assembly, um, also known as, as loitering. Uh, and the law was really there to target the black community. Uh, between January 1966 and June 1967, 170 out of 240 people arrested under Cincinnati's anti-loitering ordinance were black. Standing on a street corner or in the park talking with friends or just being black and not moving was all it took to get a loitering charge. It used to be a vagrancy charge back in the day. Um, the CPD could employ the loitering ordinance to break up political gatherings, which it did more than once, uh, which they regarded as um, potential riots in the making. The demand to overturn this law was a central catalyst for the rebellion, uh, but the city wouldn't budge. In fact, the Supreme Court eventually declared the ordinance unconstitutional in 1971. Uh, instead, the city council passed a series of draconian emergency ordinances that impose harsher, pen harsher penalties for rioting uh, or impending uh, uh, or impeding rather the work of firemen and other city workers during civil unrest. The state legislature followed up with a law granting mayors greater executive power to implement emergency measures and extending immunity to police and National Guard for liability for injury or death caused during riots. The city council then passed another ordinance strengthening the state's anti-riot law. Uh, it also allocated half a million dollars to hire 50 more police officers rather than invest in any kind of community police relations. Um, and over the course of the next three decades, the CPD became even more brutal and less accountable to either the communities it's supposed to serve or to public officials. It came to exemplify the worst aspects of racialized state violence. Um, <clears throat> between 1967 and 2000, the Cincinnati Police Department was subject of 17 separate investigations in countless lawsuits alleging a persistent pattern of racism and misconduct. Now in the book, I talk about these, I'm not gonna talk about these, uh, today. Um, now the change in CPD uh, practice was consistent with national developments in policing. The global sump of the 1970s, the decline in municipal revenue, uh, the rise of, of, in urban crime rates, the concentration of urban poverty, uh, the sharpening class divisions, the destruction and collapse of radical social movements, and a racist backlash extolling law and order as a solution to social crises. Um, all of this together combined fueled more aggressive policing and growing resentment, primarily among white officers. Uh, in March, 1979, 600 wives of police officers calling themselves United for Police and Community Service, I should say white wives. Um, there was a black organization of police officers called the, the Sentinel, um, which I might say something about. Uh, but these were the white wives of white police officers. Um, they marched on City Hall to demand more powerful weapons and protective equipment and to condemn any criticism of police officers. Two months later, police officers staged their own protests in a one day strike. Officers surrounded City Hall with 60 cruisers, turned on their emergency and headlights, locked their doors, uh, and enjoined hundreds of other marching police uh, officers to police headquarters and then threw their keys in a pile. The city council eventually gave them almost everything they wanted, high powered 357 Magnums, expansion um, 
bullets, bulletproof vests, and a number of other things. <clears throat> now, on February 23rd, 1999, Bomani Taihimba, a well-respected entrepreneur and community activist, uh, went to pick up his 11-year-old son from school in Avondale, which is another uh, Black community. He parked his van across the street from the school and noticed police officers behind him. As he got out of the car and began to walk toward them, they drew their guns and ordered him, um, ordered him back in his van. Uh, with a gun um, barrel just inches from his head, the officers removed his keys, handcuffed him, and put him in the back of the squad car and left him there. 20 minutes later, he was released and issued a ticket for left of center and improper change, of course. So it's a moving violation that they witnessed, um, they claimed they witnessed before. Two months later, he sued the city, alleging that Cincinnati police officers stopped, searched, and used excessive force and illegally detained him at gunpoint with no probable cause except for being black. Now he had a case. Police use of force in Cincinnati had increased by 44% between 1997 and 2000, despite a 9% drop in the city's violent crime rate. Although African-Americans made up 43% of the city's population in 2000, they constituted the majority of victims of police violence. Two thirds of those pepper sprayed by police during this period were black. Between 1998 and 2000, a 400 officers who had exceeded the departmental threshold of use of force, only 72 were reviewed. Now the Sentinel Police Association, which is like I mentioned, the organization of black officers, uh, presented the city with its own study of racist policing, which contained over 150 complaints from black uh, Cincinnatians, recounting incidents of racial profiling, illegal searches and seizures, excessive force, and being charged with disorderly conduct simply for asking an officer for uh, his or her name or badge number. Some cops took Polaroid photographs of people during traffic stops uh, to keep in the cruisers for future monitoring, um, as they put it, even when there was no charge. And by the way, this is something that um, uh, happens in uh, is real, Israeli defense forces were doing uh, with Palestinians taking Polaroids, taking pictures of um, Palestinian children. But even more common uh, were the broken windows uh, police taxi, tactics, or frequent stops without probable cause, and relentless imposition of, um, of citations and fines. Again, something you saw in Ferguson, something you saw all over the country. Between March of 1999 and December of 2000, uh, uh, African-Americans received 81% of all citations for driving without proof of insurance, 72% of all citations for driving under suspension or without a license, 70% of all citations for driving without a seatbelt, and 79% of all jaywalking citations. In December 2000, Tahimba uh, turned his case into a class action lawsuit, joining forces with the ACLU, the Black United Front, and 28 other plaintiffs. The turning point was the killing of a 29-year-old Black man named Roger Owensby Jr. by two CPD officers, Robert Blaine George, uh, George and uh, Patrick Caton. Owensby was number 12 of 14 black men up to that point killed by CPD since 1995. He was a veteran of the Gulf War, had a nine-year-old daughter and no criminal record. Uh, on the night of November 7th, George Caden and a black officer named David Hunter spotted Owensby in a convenience store. He was there buying a, an energy drink and proceeded to interrogate him as soon as he walked out the door. Owensby complied uh, to a search but complained about his treatment and urged them to just like run a check on him. Um, they held him in custody uh, despite finding no drugs or weapons or contraband or anything. Hunter then got his face and asked if he'd ever run from the police. Now no one could know what Owensby was thinking at the time but he probably shared Thomas's fear of the cops. Uh, so he took off running 
He didn't get but 25 or 30 feet before he was tackled to the ground. The three of them then piled up on Owensby to subdue him and handcuff him. A Jorg put him in a chokehold. Hunter pepper sprayed him and Caden continued to dig his knee into his back and punch him. When they finally decided to pick him up, he was unresponsive. So they threw his limp and bleeding body into the back seat of a patrol car without checking to see if he had a pulse. By this time, 13 cops had arrived on the scene and they were all congratulating each other for overtaking and beating a, a black man who had no contraband, no weapons and no criminal record. The coroner, rule, the coroner ruled that Owensby died by mechanical asphyxiation. Now, Timothy Thomas's death was the proverbial straw that, um, uh, but the suffocation of Roger Owensby Jr. had left the camel irreparably fractured. Thomas and Owensby were just two of thousands of victims of a war on drugs that, as we'll see, took the form of domestic military operations. Uh, they were killed because they refused to submit to a system with a long history of criminalizing Black people, rendering any resistance a threat to social order. And like Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, Owensby and Thomas were actually running for their lives. So why didn't Owensby's killing spark a rebellion? Well, part of it has to do with, the fact, with where Timothy Thomas died. Um, over the Rhine, the epicenter of the rebellion had been the site of a colonial land war for at least two decades. And Thomas was caught in the crossfire. At the time of the shooting, the neighborhood was 77% black and the median annual household income had dropped to about $6,000. It was a land of abandoned, desolate, burned out buildings, a large unhoused population and an army of jobless youth hustling and selling drugs in the shadows of classic Victorian architecture. In other words, it was a developer's dream. Conveniently located adjacent to the central downtown business district, it was the home of the 123-year-old music hall, a pre home of pre-war tenement buildings, primed for conversion into hip loft spaces, classic storefronts, um, evocative of the days of German breweries, bars, and restaurants, and also a prominent place on the National Register of Historic Places. Simply put, it wasn't the warrants that killed Thomas. Owensby, Thomas, and countless Black people in and around Cincinnati were casualties of a much longer war rooted in the system of racial capitalism and settler colonialism, a brutal war for the purposes of extracting wealth from black bodies, enclosing black people in under-resourced neighborhoods, uh, cycles of debt in cages, banishing black communities deemed obstacles to capital accumulation and settler desire, and crushing movements for freedom, equity, power, autonomy, and justice. In other words, the rebellion started more, I'm sorry, the rebellion targeted more than police violence. It was the culmination of a longer war against dispossession, exploitation, organized abandonment, erasure, and the theft of black uh, labor. Timothy Thomas's final low speed chase ended on contested land. Entrepreneurs, speculators, developers, preservationists, and cultural elites have been trying to take back the land once occupied by German emigres for uh, since at least the 1970s. Um, and that story of, of Over the Rhine is a very interesting one, uh, which I talk about in the book going back to the 19th century as a space uh, for the, the German left in the early 20th century and a safe space for Black people um, in the late 19th century. Another story. Uh, they wanted the land, but they didn't want the people. They ramped up their efforts in the 1990s with help from the city and its coercive arm. Between 1995 and 2001, police made an average of 2,300 drug arrests per year in Over the Rhine, a neighborhood whose total population barely exceeded 7,600 in 2000. But to understand why Thomas died there and why Over the Rhine, OTR, uh, blew up 
requires um, that we look beyond policing to other forms of violence, specific, specifically the violence of racial capitalism and gentrification. So for two decades at least, OTR was recognized as the home of poor white Appalachian migrants, war and poverty resources, social services, and community development programs were aimed at over the rise uh, white poor, as well as its steadily growing black poor. In 1970, African Americans made up a little over one third of its population of about 15,000. Uh, but by the late 70s, the war on poverty was dead. In its place was a war on the poor, a war on social services, a war on taxes, and a neoliberal turn toward privatization and private enterprise. The city put money into renovating over the Rhine for the purposes of gentrification. And in 1979, a private preservation group uh, planned to nominate uh, over the Rhine uh, to be part of the National Register of Historic Places. Community organizers resisted this move for obvious reasons. It meant that owners of property would get a 25% uh, federal tax investment um, credit uh, for renovating, which dramatically would raise property values and make over the Rhine properties attractive to speculators. Poor renters, which is to say most of the residents would be pushed out. And they knew full well that developers uh, guarantees of no displacement rang hollow without rent control ordinances or anti-displacement measures. Spearheading the struggle against gentrification was the Over the Rhine's People's uh, Movement, uh, OTRPM. Founded in 1970 as a coalition of 10 progressive groups, OTRPM uh, brought together grassroots activists, academics, clergy, and unhoused people to fight for affordable housing, social services, and economic development that did not entail displacement. Its intrepid leader, Buddy Gray, pictured there at the front, ran the drop-in center, which is a homeless shelter in Over the Rhine, and founded the Race Street Tenant Organizing Cooperative, or Restock, a low-income housing cooperative that purchased and renovated dilapidated housing units in the neighborhood with money from the city, from city grants in particular, from federal funding and from volunteer uh, labor. Uh, Restock became a thorn in the side of developers be, uh, because its mission was to control and renovate as much housing stock as possible for homeless and underhoused people in the neighborhood. Um, the Over the Rhine People's Movement in Gray were accused of stockpiling, depressing property values, of keeping uh, Black residents in poverty. It was really a specious claim since you know, the, availability of low, the availability of low income housing uh, does not cause poverty. The absence of jobs, low wages, poor education, violence, cuts in uh, services and supports, uh, racism and sexism, not to mention predatory lending like payday loan companies and predatory policing. Um, this is what explains the ongoing cycle of poverty, not low income housing. Nevertheless, business interests in the city uh, invited the Urban Land Institute to come up with a plan to redevelop over the Rhine, which is a decision made behind closed doors without consulting the Over the Rhine Community Council. The ULI's um, final recommendation, of course, uh, was predictable. It called on, you know, it said that they needed to promote uh, private home ownership, shift public funds from social services, the underwriting private development, uh, place a moratorium on all new low-income housing, uh, build up the arts district surrounding Washington Park, establish more businesses, more restaurants, art galleries, and prepare to move the people out. Uh, conceding that displacement was ine inevitable, they proposed setting aside resources to assist with relocation. Uh, local business owners were keen on relocating the drop-in center, uh, the homeless, the black poor, and Buddy Gray, and making the arts district safe for wealthy patrons. When the Over the Rhine People's Movement fought back, city authorities and corporate forces waged a smear campaign against the movement and the community as a whole. The media portrayed Buddy Gray and his supporters as poverty pimps, ghetto mongers, separatists, um, standing in the way of progress. 
then later that year, at least one barrier to so-called progress was eliminated. On November 15, 1996, Wilbur Worthen, a black resident in uh, one of Restock's units who had a history of uh, severe mental illness, who um, Betty Gray had actually helped get into the unit, walked into the drop-in center's office armed with a 357 Magnum uh, revolver and ended Buddy Gray's life. And many members in the Over the Rhine People's Movement believed it was a political assassination since the odds that Worthen uh, could get such a weapon on his own were slim. They felt like the, someone used him uh, to kill Buddy Gray. Finally, in yet another ironic twist, the forces of gentrification benefited from new federal guidelines that were intended to reduce racial segregation in concentrated poverty. Uh, new low-income housing receiving HUD funds were no longer permitted uh, to be used in impoverished areas. And the idea was to distribute affordable and Section 8 housing throughout the city. And what that meant was that if Restock wanted to continue to get grants from the city to rehabilitate buildings, the city council required them to sell some of its other properties for, uh, to for-profit developers. Then in October, 2001, the city council passed an ordinance prohibiting the city from supporting in any way low-income housing in so-called impacted areas, which is to say poor neighborhoods. Now the fight didn't end there, but the stage was set for over the Rhine's new settler regime to move in. At the time of the rebellion, about 600 businesses belonged to the Over the Rhine Chamber of Congre Commerce. Uh, Main Street was the jewel in the crown as art galleries and restaurants and jazz clubs replaced liquor stores and pawn shops. Um, and they got what they wanted. They got the land, uh, but the people were still there. Uh, fear of the black poor spawned a cottage industry uh, for cops looking for extra work, cops like David Damico. Meanwhile, as private developers prepared to leverage public funds to colonize over the Rhine, the city received $100, uh, $100 million of empowerment zone money from the Department of, of Housing and Urban Development. And in 1999, HUD declared parts of nine uh, predominantly black neighborhoods in Cincinnati, uh, quote unquote, economic disaster areas. A mix of grants, tax credits, credits and tax breaks to businesses, property owners and developers uh, were supposed to create jobs, housing and stimulate commercial activity. But Cincinnati's black neighborhoods received less than 3% of all the empowerment zone funds. Uh, and this is a big scandal, which I write about. I'm not gonna say much about, but I could just say that an audit of the Cincinnati Empowerment Zone Corporation exposed numerous instances of mismanagement uh, and investment outside of the designated zones. The city continued to prioritize downtown development rather than address the problems of housing and, and homelessness. And in the wake of the 2001 rebellion, the city council voted to give money to Saks Fifth Avenue, uh, $6.6 .6 million actually, to upgrade its window display when it threatened to leave downtown. And Kroger's national supermarket chain got $15 million. Two black folks a bone. In 1997, it backed the creation of an underground railroad. I got disconnected, huh? Okay. Let's see if I can go back. Hopefully they didn't miss too much. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, oh, close the door, please. No, I'm, I'm back on. Okay, sorry. I didn't know my wife was watching too, so she told me the internet went out. Um, so where did I leave off? Was I talking about um, three minutes? God. <laughs> 
Okay. Let's see. Okay, did I talk about sex with Adam? Yes, yeah, stop right there. Okay, good. Um, so let me just go back to this. So to cover for its singular focus on downtown development at the expense of black and low-income communities, after given you know six million dollars to Saks Fifth Avenue, the city and its corporate allies uh, threw black folks a bone. In 1997, it backed the creation of an underground railroad museum and Freedom Center on the waterfront. Conceived by academics, the museum was a corporate project from the very beginning. Procter and Gamble and American Financial Group underwrote and raised uh, much of the money uh, from pr uh, private funds to cover the construction of the facility. And the museum was intended as a source of pride, honoring Cincinnati's role in the struggle for black freedom, but it became a source of frustration and contention. Um, rather, let's see, close that, than satisfy black discontent, it brought into sharp relief a neoliberal political culture willing to spend millions to represent histories of black freedom while denying living black people freedom, resources, and security. In fact, when the museum officially opened in August of 2004, the Black United Front, the Cincinnati Progressive, Cincinnati Progressive Action, and several other organizations created a pop-up People's Underground Railroad Museum on Fountain Square in protest. Now, okay, let's see. Now there's a much larger story that I'm skipping here, um, having to do with the, the, the left in Cincinnati and other militant organizations. But let me just say, um, believe me that that happened, uh, but, but that the militancy of black youth and pressure from the left um, actually further radicalized the movement, leading to the formation of the Coalition for Just Cincinnati, which called for a boycott of the city uh, on July 17, 2001. And by boycott, they're like, no conventions, no tourism, uh, no entertainment, um, as well as a citywide boycott of all downtown businesses. Uh, the movement expanded to support, um, expanded um, its support and generated uh, alliances with the Black United Front uh, and a group um, and other groups and formed the Combined Coalition for Justice and Racial Equality. Their demands went far beyond policing. They wanted 1.5 billion in public and private funds to revitalize Cincinnati's economic disaster areas, investment in job creation, a black home ownership, uh, black business development, uh, an end to discriminatory lending practices, a change to the city's charger, charter so that uh, city council members are elected by districts or proportional representation. That's a story I tell in the book going back uh, to the 1920s and 30s. Um, restore campaign finance reform uh, and grant local uh, political campaigns greater access to local television uh, and a bunch, bunch of other things focusing on healthcare uh, racial health disparities, uh, funding for education, hiring more Black teachers, reducing suspensions and expulsions. It's a long list. Now, of course, this is a tall order, but it followed uh, the logic that reversing decades of racism and divestment from Black communities would require transformative change. Now, Reverend Lynch uh, openly supported the boycott uh, and his support of the boycott actually angered the city's corporate interests and the mayor, who felt the Black United Front was no longer acting in good faith as a member of the Cincinnati Community Action Now, which is the, um, the joint commission created by the mayor to try to resolve the conflicts and, 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 and tensions. Uh, but ultimately, their relationship unraveled, especially after Stephen Roach was acquitted. So. Damon Lynch, who's picture, pictured there, uh, sent a letter to, I'm sorry, Mayor Lynch sent a letter to the mayor questioning the city's commitment to justice and accusing the police of, quote, killing, raping, planting false evidence, uh, and describing the condition of Black people in Cincinnati as, quote, the highest stage of apartheid. He concluded that the situation had, 
reached a point where only national and international economic sanctions uh, may get the attention of the corporate leaders and their political servants. Uh, so of course, Mayor Lucan promptly fired Reverend Lynch from his co-chairmanship of, um, of CAN, which is uh, Cincinnati Community Action Now. Now, Cincinnati could hardly uh, afford another boycott. The LGBTQ community called for um, a boycott in 1993 after voters approved Article 12 of the city charter, which expressly excluded uh, sexual orientation from protected categories under city's, uh, the city's human rights ordinance. And as a result of the boycott, the city lost an estimated $40 million in revenue. And in 2001, it was still in effect. The boycott compelled the city to move quickly to settle the, the whole class action suit by the ACLU and the Black United Front um, and to begin the collaborative process of reforming the police. Uh, in May of 2003, the city paid out a total of $4.5 million to 16 of the play plaintiffs, including Angela Leisure and Bomani uh, Tayimba. And it was by far the largest single police misconduct settlement in the city's history. In 2002 in April, the city entered the, into a collaborative agreement between the ACLU, the Black United Front, and um, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police to begin the process of reforming um, uh, police policy. Uh, despite constant sabotage and non-cooperation by the police uh, administration, by the time the first agreement ended in 2008, the CPD had introduced a number of changes to its use of force policy, things that are not surprising, including banning chokeholds, limiting the use of chemical irritants, um, beanbags, shotguns, and rubber bullets to instances where a person is inflicting imminent physical harm to police or other people. Uh, in other words, the regular strategies used during protests had to be pulled back. Um, they pivoted to tasers rather than guns uh, and created a team of specially trained police officers to respond to mental health crises. The CPD improved its monitoring of use of force and civilian complaints and established a civilian complaint authority. Uh, the boycott of course didn't win most of its demands but the collaborative agreement was considered a significant victory. In fact, big enough to call off the boycott in 2007. Meanwhile, while all this is happening, um, uh, the struggle in over the Rhine continues. In 2002, with the support of Miami uh, University, Thomas Dutton, uh, who's a professor there, he passed away recently, and his students renovated a storefront on the corner of 13th and Vine and called it the Center for Community Engagement. The center promoted community-based collaborative research projects and encouraged students to make art and they renovated some of the um, abandoned homes. It embodied the, the principles and the spirit of the Over the Vine People's Movement, which uh, Dutton was a part of, and attempted to keep the movement's momentum alive. Against this, David stood uh, a Goliath, that is the Cincinnati Center City Development Corporation, or 3CDC, which is a private not-for-profit company created by the city and its corporate backers in 2003. 3CDC did for private investors what Restock tried to do for the unhoused, and that is buy up as many properties in over the Rhine as possible uh, for redevelopment. Um, but 3DC had a different, um, 3CDC rather, had a different agenda. They received giant tax abatements to buy buildings and then held them until the right deal came along. They operated with no oversight or input from the community. The strategy worked. Buying up and boarding up buildings all along Vine Street further marginalized and isolated poor residents. Street, street crime declined. Uh, but by 2007, six years after Thomas's death, the police made over the Rhine even more dangerous. Broken windows policing went into high gear with Operation Vortex. Um, and under the Operation Vortex, the poor were being arrested or ticketed for the smallest quality of life infractions, littering, jaywalking, spitting, loitering, drinking from an open container, crossing against the light, 
selling drugs, appearing to sell drugs, that sort of thing. Um, people selling uh, the newspaper Street Fives, which was uh, put out by the Cincinnati Coalition for the Homeless, were treated as panhandlers and therefore in violation of a city ordinance against panhandling. Um, sleeping in a park proved deadly. In fact, um, one woman, Joanne Burton, was killed by police in July 2010 when she was run over by a police vehicle driving on the grass while she was sleeping. Um, so to come to a conclusion, as black people disappeared from over the Rhine, either by moving, dying, or being jailed, 3CDC started moving those properties, carving out hip lofts, single family residences, retail spaces. Um, and by 2014, over the Rhine was two thirds white. By 2015, affordable housing in the neighborhood had shrunk by 73% on than what it was in 2002. Uh, today, poor black people or, or, occupy a very, very tiny, very, very tiny strip um, north of Vine Street and across Liberty Street. And the CPD, with its elaborate collaborative agreement, is considered a model for all US police departments. Then, postscript, on June 9, 2015, uh, Cincinnati police officers entered the home of 22-year-old Quan Davier Hicks and fatally shot him in the chest. And they were responding to a call that someone had been uh, threatened with a gun. Hicks, of course, was unarmed at the time. 40 days later, Samuel DuBose was killed by an officer of the University of Cincinnati Police Department. The father, was, uh, father of 13 was a rapper, music producer, and entrepreneur. And like most black men from Cincinnati, he did have a record. Between 1995 and 2009, he was charged 13 times for driving without a license, four times for not having a proper license plate. In 2005, uh, he just served uh, uh, less than a year in state prison on a marijuana uh, charge. And on July 19th, 2015, a UCPD officer, Ray Tensing, stopped him from missing a front license plate. DuBose did not have his license on him, which had been suspended, in fact. Tensing proceeded to open the driver's side door, uh, driver's side, uh, uh, a door and ordered DuBose to remove his seatbelt. Instead, DuBose closed the door, put the car in, in gear, uh, and before he could drive away, Tensing uh, shot him to death. Like Thomas and Owensby, he felt compelled to run. Two years later, after one mistrial and another trial ending in a hung jury, Ray Tensing successfully evaded responsibility. The next week, March 12th, Samuel DuBose would have celebrated his 49th birthday. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. And okay, and I'm gonna stop and I could take uh, questions or comments. Yes, so thank you very much for that fascinating and all too disturbing uh, historical background to recent police murders uh, in Cincinnati. An all too American story, of course. Um, so the way we're going to proceed is we have approximately 20 minutes. And um, for those of you who'd like to ask a question, we have a good number of people here who are attending this. So in, in the interest of time, what I'm going to ask you to do is ask brief questions. Uh, try not to go on at too much length. Maybe we'll take two at a time. How does that okay. sound? That sounds um, good. So if, what you do is you simply, for those of you who may not be familiar with this, go to the participants option on the bottom menu of your screen. Um, and you can indicate by putting in, um, you can raise your hand and sort of clue me that you want to ask a question. Um, you can also, if you're a shyer person, you can ask a question in the chat. Um, so, and I will read them out for, uh, okay. so um, who would like to go who would like to ask a question? Please indicate. All right. Well, I have one in the chat, okay. which is Laura Sullivan, who says, who asks, thinking back to Neil Smith's analysis of the colonialist metaphors employed regarding gentrification, uh, 
e.g. inviting people to become pioneers, to move into the frontier of a newly redeveloped neighborhood, I'm struck by your framing of speculation and displace displacement in the terms of colonialism. I can see how these two framings, one by the neoliberal <clears throat> elite and developers and the other as a point of critique serve different purposes. Can you say more about how you understand the colonizing forces applied to neighborhoods like over the Rhine? Um, Taylor Woods has a question. If Taylor, you would activate your camera and microphone, that would be great. Hey, Robin, thank you so much. Hey. I yeah. think your talk mentioned the Umbrella Progressive Organization in Cincinnati and their work and you know their work in the Freedom Project. I was wondering if you could say anything about um, you know lessons they have today and any limitations there were to you know post crisis you know post 1970 um, progressive organizations rooted in a city. Right. Okay, so there's, so two things. Let me just go to the um, uh, first question and then go to your question, Taylor. Um, Cause I have some notes on your question, Taylor. Uh, so on the first question, you know, um, to give a very short answer to a very excellent question about, you know, how I understand colonizing forces apply to neighbors like over the Rhine, um, you know, for me, those two framings that you lay out in the question, um, I see them as sort of two sides of the same coin. You know, maybe um, I'm mistaken here, but um, you know, certainly, if we think of of settler colonialism as not something that's an event but an ongoing process. Um, and if you think of it also in terms of, of uh, a particular kind of class orientation and class politics, uh, then you know, we're gonna, we would see, I would argue, that what's happening in places like over the Rhine um, is a kind of taking back of land that, you know, when you think about the longer history of over the Rhine, um, it was one next to the West End where much of the black community was sort of uh, packed in after World War II uh, and um, was kind of off limits for a while. And due to a number of different policies after World War II, you get this kind of shift from being a working class white community to then being a, a working class, mostly white, mostly black community. Um, but even before that, over the Rhine was was an ethnic enclave for the Germans that became also an enclave for the, for the socialists. A movement in Cincinnati. Um, but for the most part, I think of over the Rhine uh, that, that you see competing interests for control over the land uh, and not just completing neoliberal interests on the part of developers. But one of the things that you do see though is alternative planning, a kind of counter planning that's taking place in over the Rhine people's movement might be an example of, of counter planning that is, um, it's not enough to just hold the land, but it's enough to sort of come up with a different vision of, of what development might look like. Um, and so whether or not you call this anti-colonial or not, um, that might be a stretch, but it's definitely, you know, pushing back against neoliberalism. So I guess I'm sort of seeing them both operating at the same time um, uh, simultaneously. Um, now, as far as uh, the question, uh, you know, what I didn't really get into was the whole long issue of where the left was, uh, you know, and the, the uh, March for Justice, which was organized by, um, uh, by a number of different organizations in, the, um, in this coalition. So, the coalition, you know, which included groups like the Coalition for Humane Economy, CHE, the Zapatista Coalition, Refuse and Resist, um, uh, the ISO, uh, a lot of these organizations actually uh, were, had come together um, in November 2000 uh, when uh, you had this fight against 
uh, globalization and neoliberalism when the transatlantic business dialogue uh, showed up in Cincinnati. And they were engaged in direct action. Many activists were arrested. And in fact, the Cincinnati rebellion became an opportunity for a segment of, of that um, coalition to think about direct action and figure out how ways to support the rebellion, which then shaped from that point on uh, a lot of the, um, the you know, black bloc um, strategies that we see in some of the protests against police violence. Much of that begins there. Um, it also led to a kind of a split. And I can't really get into the whole story of the split uh, because um, you know, even uh, members, of the, even the Black United Front, for example, under uh, Damon Lynch, ended up supporting some of the gentrification uh, policies in Over the Rhine and supported the work of the Urban Land Institute, ironically. Um, the other thing that happened was there was a, just really briefly, um, there was a split uh, where groups like the Cincinnati Radical Action Group uh, was going into places like upscale Mount uh, Adams neighborhood, blocking traffic to draw attention to the kind of double standard that took place uh, after, during the rebellion when the curfew that was imposed affected black communities but didn't affect the upscale communities. And that caused kind of a rift uh, where some of the other left organizations were saying, you know, we need to be standing in solidarity with black community. We don't need to go in there and disrupting um, uh, uh, white folks. So those are just some of the splits that took place. But what it does tell us uh, is that there's a much larger story to be told about what are the strategies, I don't mean allies, but what are the strategies to build radical movements uh, in the midst of black rebellion against state violence? You know, um, and where where do um, Marxist Leninists and anarchist organizations fit in these these kinds of struggles? And I think Cincinnati was a kind of test case for these relationships. I don't know if that answers the question if I'm missing something. But okay, so um, Tanisha Grant has a question. Tanisha, okay. if you're able to um, activate your camera and microphone, that'd be great. Hello, my name is Tanisha Grant. I'm an activist in New York City. Um, hi, Robin, thank you for hi. all that you do and um, for your presentation, it was wonderful. Um, my question is, why do you think that America is so desensitized to the Black struggle, to the, to the dying of Black people? Um, Cincinnati, Cincinnati is just one city out of many all over the country. Why is everyone else struggle and oppression in this country more important than the people that suffer the most? Right, that's an excellent question. And you're right, Cincinnati is one of many cities. And the thing that I found is that the story in Cincinnati could be told anywhere just about, especially, especially in the region. I mean, in, in Missouri and in, in the Midwest and in, in the both coasts. But your big question is, why is America so desensitized to black suffering and black struggle? Um, well, the, the short answer is, um, it, it, we have a long history where this country was built on the enslavement of black people, the dispossession of indigenous peoples. Uh, this is the foundation and that foundation uh, is still with us. Um, but what I do wanna say though, is to take your question and then to slightly turn it to ask another question, which I think is, is underlying your question. What is required for that to change? What are the examples where uh, people actually do decide to throw their lot in with, with Black people's struggles in changing the terms that uh, and the conditions that lead to our premature death in suffering and violence? What is it? that changes. And the thing about Cincinnati is so interesting is that there, there were people who are not Black who actually threw themselves in uh, into the movement. And Cincinnati is important because it's the first rebellion, anti-police rebellion of the 21st century that 
fra that really framed what happens, you know, what happened with, uh, with um, up to, to, to Ferguson, what happened in Baltimore, what happened, you know, it's the one that really was the, the, the model. And what I find interesting is how many working class and poor white people, not that many, but enough, and some white radicals actually participated in supporting the rebellion around Timothy Thomas. I mean, I don't ever expect to get 5% of anybody <laughs> involved in the struggle, but the fact that you can get so many um, shouldn't, should be a, a, a place to study. Like what is it, what is different? And I give credit to um, a former student of mine, Gavin Leonard, who was a student of mine at NYU. He was the one who hit me to, he is a white student who hit me to um, over the Rhine in the first place. He's the one who said, you need to go there and check it out. He introduced me to Tom Dutton. So I was at the Center for Community Engagement speaking to community folks back at, right after, in fact, a year after the rebellion. And Gavin himself became an activist and organized Cop Watch and organized uh, with a number of other people on the ground. Uh, and so the fact that they made this leap, we had, to, and for them, the leap wasn't just saying, I pity black people, I wanna be their allies. The leap was recognizing that the war on over the Rhine and the war on black people was a war, was a class war too. It was a war against black people, a war against brown people, and a war against all working people. And they saw it. And when they saw it, people started to come together. The problem is, is that the consumerism that went into the transformation of Over the Rhine into a, a place that you can go and drink coffee, you know, and see art, that drew much of the community in and, and made the black community the enemy. And, the black, and some of the black elites, and this is the thing, some of the black elites who supported the underground museum, which is a great thing, I'm not against the museum, but some of those black elites were not necessarily supporting the struggles among poor black people trying to save that land and transform it and redevelop it in a way that could benefit the community. So when you start to look at what the, what the state of depression looks like, you've got a lot of black people getting their butts kicked got a lot of white people benefiting from that. A handful of white people standing there trying to fight with them and, and brown people and Asian American fighting. Um, and then you got a black elite who's participating and kicking their ass. And, that's, and it, that's what it looks like. And that's what it looks like in just about every city. And so um, unless we can build movements that can um, create a, a better understanding of why it is we get beat. In other words, it's not just because we're black, it's because we're black and we stand in the way. It's because we're black and because we refuse to be exploited. It's because we're black and like Timothy Thomas and Roger Owensby and others, we run from the police because we don't want to have anything to do with them. It's because we black, we're black and we fight back. If we just let things go, they wouldn't bother us, you know? So that's to me, the lesson that we have to kind of get from this and how to build a movement. Um, and it's hard because like the work that you're doing, it's, it's hard work because sometimes you feel like you don't have anybody around you supporting you, you know, except for people who don't have a lot of resources. So I appreciate it. Thank so. you. Okay, let's go to a couple of people who have been waiting for a while. Um, Eric Earl and then Petra. So if the two of you can take turns, Eric, first, again, activate your camera and microphone. Ah, hi, thanks, Robin. This has been really great. Um, I was in my mid twenties in Cincinnati um, at the time of the rebellion and all the stuff that went on before it, you know, and for many of us in Cincinnati at the time that it was a definitive turning movement uh, mm -hmm. moment for all of us. Um, and we've become lifelong activists uh, and I think that that's incredibly important. I think that the way that you were talking about the different left groups that were organizing and participating was really useful. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the way that the Black United Front and some of the traditions of Black radicalism sort of played out within that organization. 
So some of the contradictions that are there, you know, you spoke about the civil rights boycott around the um, anti-gay le uh, uh, legislation that was on the books. Um, but then at the same time, we have someone like Fred Shuttlesworth uh, right. in the city. Um, and then within the Black United Front itself, <clears throat> both sort of radical left-wing revolutionaries, people that were part of the Black Panther Party, but then also, you know, sort of nationalist organizations like right. the Black Fist organization. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to, to, some, of, to some of that and how you see, right. how you understand those dynamics. Okay, that's a great question. I, I got to take one more, right? Uh, I mean, you can answer that and then we'll go to Petra. Um, okay. Slova. I'm sorry, oh. I butchered that name. Right, so very, very, very quickly. Yes, there's, there's a lot of history there. And I talk about Fred Shuttle's work and Damon Lynch Sr., who's actually um, Damon Lynch's father, um, who's also active in some of the civil rights struggles there. The fact that the organization of Afro-American unity had a chapter in Cincinnati, that, that much of the rebellion in 67 and 68 was organized. Uh, in 68, he actually had a black security force organized by some of the black nationalist organizations uh, that um, was meant to replace, at least temporarily, the police in the community. So yeah, there's a long history, which I can't, I can't tell you that long history, but they're very, very important. The, in answer to the specific question, the Black United Front was, um, under Damon Lynch and others was a complicated formation because you had these amazing people like Iris Rowley and others. Uh, but in terms of its class politics, it was, it was complicated because on the one hand, um, there were people who were fighting the police but also wanted uh, a more traditional capitalist development um, in certain communities and felt like black business was one way to go. And there were others who are more left oriented, who are not necessarily at the center of the Black United Front, um, who were pushing from a, another perspective. So it's hard to say. I mean, you could see how that organization, that formation as a United Front, pulling together different political tendencies, did shift. And that shift, I argue, uh, was the result of being pressed by new formations, youth formations, um, and by the um, by the groups that eventually formed the, uh, the, the March for Justice in, in um, July or June of 2001. Uh, and they got pushed to the left in some ways, but then eventually were isolated. So it's, it's a, the book will tell more of that story, but it's a kind of ebb and flow uh, that you're absolutely right. We have to consider all of the various organizations that, he, that emerged, even going back uh, to Peter A. Clark, uh, the Black socialist in Cincinnati in the late 19th century, who was a kind of figure in the post-Reconstruction era as well. Um, and one last thing, uh, there's a story to be told about proportional representation and how it was created initially as a way by the corporate interests to have moneyed figures, uh, you know, con control the city council at these at-large elections. In fact, uh, Gamble from Procter & Gamble came up with the idea in the 20s, but after World War II, with the expansion of the labor movement and the expansion of, of black population, they were able to win elections uh, in the 50s. And then at some point, proportional representation was, was voted down by the, by the populace. And that's also an important part of the, the civil rights struggle for political uh, representation in Cincinnati. So I believe Petra is next. Petra, if you can activate your camera and microphone. Hi. Hello. Can you can you hear me? Can you see me? Uh, well, uh, I'm <laughs> I'm calling in from very far away. I'm from the Czech Republic, Prague, and I'm working on my uh, class about decolonization and all. And I want to go through different places in the world. But I mean, my question is sort of tiny and very outlandish. And that's, I find it quite amazing that someone who was 19 was caught 10 times for not having his whatever driving documents or license on him. So how is that possible? 
I do not know about anyone in my surrounding who would be called so many times for such a tiny minor thing. So is it part of the systemic racism of your police or how would you explain that? Um, it is absolutely without a doubt part of the systemic racism of the police. Um, I, I ended with um, Samuel DuBose's record for a reason uh, because he's another man who had tons of traffic tickets and for the same thing. Um, and so imagine, it's not like Timothy Thomas even had a car that often. Uh, much of the car that he drove was a borrowed car for the most part. He had his own for a minute. Uh, and so he was constantly stopped by the police. Now multiply Timothy Thomas by about 20,000. And then two things happen. You, three things happen. One, you have a lot of criminalized black men and women uh, two, you generate a whole lot of revenue for the city, you know, who are paying off these tickets. And three, you get a database. And that database gives you lists of names of people who didn't commit, like I said, these are misdemeanors, and he didn't commit any serious crime at all. But once your name's in the database, you are considered suspect. That's how the process of criminalization works. And it's, and I say by administrative means or bureaucratic means, and that computers, lists, um, citations, all these things operate to create a, a huge um, criminalized population that's generating a whole lot of revenue for the city. Uh, and that explains why Timothy Thomas was targeted, you know, this kid. Uh, but you're right. I mean, he didn't have his license that long. And most of those tickets took place within just not even a year, just several months within March and to May. So we're over time, but I'm wondering if you're willing to take one more question. Yeah, sure. Of course, of course. Sorry, sorry. So we have in the chat a question from Kriaj Lynette um, asking, are there any effective strategies that have been done protesting real estate associations in a more targeted approach to denounce gentrification? Um, I'm sure that um, you know, there at Wisconsin, there's a million people working on this uh, very topic. Um, but, you know, when I think about this, the strategies familiar with, I mean, you know, in, for a long time, what happened in Cincinnati was a strategy um, that was actually somewhat working. And that is um, community uh, organizations uh, basically buying up abandoned buildings with, uh, with government money and holding on to them. And so it really took the efforts of redevelopers along with federal, state, and local governments to be able to take over that operation. So for a while it was actually working. They were transforming these homes into livable places using uh, student labor from the University of, of uh, Miami and Ohio and others to make these renovations. Other things, you know, other strategies, um, uh, I think, and I'm sure there's, there's many others, are, are you know, attempts at um, uh, community benefits agreements, um, cooperatives, uh, there's, um, uh, Saul Whitley uh, is an amazing scholar who has a dissertation, soon to be a book, that looks at strategies among Black women in Baltimore to resist gentrification. Um, and it's, it's complicated because sometimes even cooperative, so cooperative buying uh, could open the door uh, for the resale and, um, and, and operations that could obtain some of the properties and move people in. Um, one of the things to keep in mind too is the way gentrification often uh, works. So often it's led by people who are not necessarily at least ostensibly trying to raise property values, but trying to do things uh, like find cheap space for artist lofts or places for musicians. And they open the door because their presence as artists creates value, added value. I mean, the big issue is how do you strip value um, how do you, how you disentangle race from property values? Um, and when you could do that, 
that certainly opens up uh, the door uh, as a strategy. Um, how do you, you could pass laws, for example, that would make forms of gentrification, that is displacement illegal. The most obvious ones are things like, you know, rent control, you know, um, laws against displacement, um, provide affordable housing, the very things that, you know, the over the right people's movement is trying to do, create the conditions so that people have a place to live so they don't have to leave. Um, the vulnerability is what helps them, which creates the conditions. Um, and then finally, uh, in answering that question, we also have to ask who are the, um, what are the forces of gentrification? What do they look like? I just talked about redevelopers, but among the biggest forces, of course, are universities. The very involvement has this amazing book that's coming out, will be out any day now, which is about the university's role in, among other things, uh, gentrification, displacement, and the kind of settler violence that has affected communities from South Side Chicago to um, South Los Angeles to you know lots of places, and then um, and then of course you know having been at Columbia University back in the day when Columbia was expanding into West Harlem, engaged in its own act of displacement, student organizing along with community organizing together uh, stood up against Columbia. They didn't win, uh, but they won some things and. Um, and so sometimes thinking about strategies also means thinking about how to build alliances that are beyond the communities that are being targeted. That's all what I said was like 5% of the ideas, the other 95% other people could um, uh, talk about. It's, it's, a, it's a huge important issue.